Let's take our Bibles and turn to Mark chapter 13. We're coming to the Lord's table here this morning, but before we get there, we've got to finish up a sermon I started last week, a sermon entitled Future Events. You see, the Bible is not just a book of dusty history. The Bible is a message of gleaming hope centered on future events. And uh, Jesus has been outlining for us in Mark 13 how it's all going to come to an end. What are the events that will mark the last days that will bring us to His return? See, Jesus is going to have a second act. He's come the first time, but He's coming a second time, and He's describing this to His disciples here in Mark chapter 13. And uh, let's stand as we read together from verse 24 to 37. If you were with me last week, we covered the setting and the signs, but now we're looking at the second coming and the summons. Mark chapter 13, verse 24, Jesus is speaking, but in those days after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars of heaven will fall and the powers of heaven will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send his angels and gather together his elect from the four winds, from the tip of earth to the tip of heaven. That's how that could be literally translated. Verse 28, now, learn from this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and put forth leaves, you know the summer is near. So you also, when you see these things happening, know that it is near at the door Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will not mean, by no means pass away till all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words by no means will pass away. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven nor the Son. Let me pause there. I thought Jesus knew everything. How doesn't he know when he's not coming back? Well, remember, he's speaking here in his incarnated state. He has limited the use of His divine prerogatives. There are some things that Jesus didn't know as a man. He grows in knowledge according to Luke 2. And at this stage, He doesn't know what the date is that the Father has set for His return. Now, I believe He knows now, but not then. And that's why He's saying, guys, the angels don't know, and I don't know. Verse 32, but the Father knows. Take heed, verse 33, watch and pray, for you do not know when the time is. It is, a, it is like a man going to a far country who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to each his work and commanded the doorkeeper to watch. Watch therefore, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming, in the evening, at midnight, at the crowing of the rooster, or in the morning. Lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say to you, I say to all, <clears throat> watch. So reads God's Word. You may be seated. Future events. That's what we're looking at this morning here in Mark chapter 13. Now, as we study Mark chapter 13, in our study of Mark's gospel, we're going to see that this chapter stands out like a sore thumb. I say that because when you compare Mark 13 with the rest of the gospel, it's rather striking, and it it stands out like a sore thumb, because this is a long sermon directed to a particular issue, and it was given in one single day. And you know in our study of Mark's gospel, this is a fast-paced, action-packed gospel. It's shorter than Matthew, Mark, Luke. Or sorry, Ma- shorter than Matthew, Luke, and John. It, it, it's, it's a condensed version of the life and times of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's, it, it's dramatic. It moves along at a clip and at a pace. And yet here we come to Mark 13. In a gospel that's fast-paced, action-packed, and all of a sudden we have a very long discourse given by Jesus on a particular day focused on one subject. So it's kind of stand out. It's in a category by itself. It sticks out like a sore thumb. And the subject is prophecy. And the Lord Jesus here gives us a detailed outline of events 
leading up to His return in power and glory, which would remind you, and I think Mark is making this point, that to Jesus, the second coming was a crucial subject. So much so that Mark, in his fast-paced gospel, stops and gives us an extended version of what Jesus taught. In fact, Matthew will give us much, much more, but it's interesting in Mark's gospel that we've got this kind of long, detailed exposition. Now, here's something to write down. In Mark's gospel, Jesus gives His longest answer to a question on prophecy because this was an important subject for Him. And I find in my theological discussions with pastors today, it's not really an important subject. Pastors don't seem to be as interested and as engaged on the issues of prophecy. Many of them declare themselves to be pan-millennialists. They're not amillennialists. They're not premillennialists. They're not postmillennialists. They're simply pan-millennialists. It'll all work out in its own good time. It'll all pan out. And there's this kind of disregard for getting into detail about prophecy. I think that's sad given that Jesus' longest answer is to a prophetic question. And Christians in general, young Christians and young people in particular in this generation don't seem to be as interested in the prophetic Scriptures as a former generation. And I think, again, that's sad. I'm not encouraging, uh, you know, a, a, a Christianity that has our heads stuck in the clouds We need to be concerned about what's happening in inner cities and be concerned about social justice and politics and life and the hurting and the disadvantaged. I get all of that, but that should never come to the exclusion of an interest in prophecy, end times, and the life to come. In fact, it's the end times that should bring about a new beginning of evangelism and love and endeavor and service on our behalf any given day of the week. In fact, it was C.S. Lewis who said, those who did Much in this world were those who thought much about the next world. So it's just interesting that Jesus gives His longest answer to a question on prophecy, underscoring the importance of prophecy in Jesus' mind. It seems to me if I love Jesus and claim to be a follower of Jesus and a disciple of the Master, prophecy is a subject that should interest me. So let's come back to Mark 13. And if you were with me, last time, and we're not going to reheat this dinner, um, we covered the setting and we covered the signs. We covered the setting and we covered the signs, verses 1 through 4, and then verses 5 through 23. I want to pick up at verse 24 in what I call the second coming. This is the third thought, the second coming. Because following this grave time of great tribulation, Jesus will return. Jesus wants us to know that His his ascension into heaven was not the finale. It was a prelude to the finale. There is a second act. Remember what the angel said to the disciples? This same Jesus who you saw being received into heaven will someday return from heaven in a similar manner. There's going to be a second act. Jesus is going to come back again. There are three parts to your Bible, right? The Old Testament, He is coming. The New Testament in the Gospels, He has come. The book of Acts, the epistles, and the Revelation, He is coming again. That's your Bible in three great parts. He is coming, He has come, but He's coming again. A second act. There's going to be a finale, and Jesus tells us about it here in verse 24. After that time of great tribulation, when at the beginning of that time you'll have the birth pangs, you'll have those signs that will be repeated and become more and more as the delivery of a new age comes about. Wars, rumors of wars, persecution, deception, false Christs. Then you have the beginning signs that will mushroom into the big sign where you have the abomination of desolation, you have the appearance of Antichrist who will declare himself to be God in a rebuilt temple. We made that argument last week. I'm not going back to it. And that's what Jesus says. After these days just described, that time of tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The sun, the stars of heaven will fall and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they shall see the Son of Man coming in power and glory. Amen. 
We agree with John, even so come Lord Jesus. This is the second coming when, when human history ends at Jesus' feet. You think about that. Human history will end at Jesus' feet. That's why you should begin every day of your own personal history at Jesus' feet, because it's all going to end under His Lordship, so you better be living under His Lordship and following His ways and His commands. Now, now I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. We've covered this in other sermons, and I want to get to the practical application of this message, which I believe is always important to the Lord Jesus. But let me note for you several things that will accompany His second coming, the marks of His second coming. And remember, we would make an argument here at Kindred, this is in distinction from the rapture. We believe in a pre-tribulational coming of Christ for His church. It's described in John 14. It's described in 1 Thessalonians 4. When we will be snatched away, caught away to meet Christ in the clouds and to be with Him forever. Go to the Father's house, the marriage supper of the Lamb, the judgment seat of Christ. That's a movement from earth to heaven in its regards to the church. The second coming is a movement from heaven to earth as it regards Israel and the nations. The first time He comes for us, the second time we come come with Him and the armies of heaven, Revelation 19. So that said, here's the marks of the second coming. When we will have been glorified, the judgment seat will have taken place, the marriage supper of the Lamb will be a red and white, will be coming back with Jesus Christ. Here's how He describes it. It's going to be catastrophic. Jesus tells us here of events in the heavens, and I'm not sure what to do with all of that. Uh, Certainly, these are signs and symbols that kind of mark the day of the Lord, the judgment of God. Read about them in Joel and in, in 2 Thessalonians. But there'll be a shaking of the heavens. There'll be some kind of lights and fireworks display among the planets and the stars. And it'll almost seem like the firmament is being torn. Now, it won't fall apart but there'll be a shaking of the heavens, which is kind of an announcement that the curtain's about to be lifted and Jesus is about to come back. So it's going to be kind of catastrophic. You kind of get a sense of that, don't you, in the book of Revelation. Secondly, it's going to be sudden. For this, we go to Matthew 24, 27, where where Jesus tells us that His coming will be as swift as lightning from the east that strikes in the west. Like a, like a bolt of lightning, Jesus is going to come. It's not going to be in stages. It's not going to be in parts. After these days, after the tribulation, you'll see suddenly, catastrophically, Jesus Christ appear. That's going to be a marvelous moment, by the way. The last time the world looked at him, he looked nothing like a king hanging on a cross. In fact, Paul said, if they had known, they wouldn't have crucified the Lord of glory. There was no beauty that they would desire Him. But when He comes again, the Bible says in Revelation 1-7, those that pierced Him will mourn and all the earth will cry. Because He's coming back catastrophically, suddenly, visibly. Every eye will see Him. They'll see the Son of Man. He's coming back gloriously in power and in glory. We read in verse 26, He's coming back to liberate His people. It will be catastrophic, sudden, visible, glorious, liberating. Because He'll send His angels to gather together His elect, that's His people who are alive at the point of His return, who have survived the great tribulation, who have not taken the mark of the beast, and have certainly escaped martyrdom, although many won't. And from the tip of the earth to the tip of heaven, the, the angels will gather God's people. And at that point, it will be deliverance, liberation, freedom from persecution, the world, the flesh, and the devil. That'll be a wonderful liberating moment. And I think with that, the coming will not only be glorious, liberating, but wrathful. If there's a gathering of the saints alive at that time, according to Jesus here, consequently, subsequently, there's going to be a scattering of the unbeliever. I think Matthew hints at this, doesn't he? Or certainly Jesus in Matthew's account. When you go to Matthew 24, verse 28, Jesus is speaking, Matthew records it, Mark doesn't, and he tells us this, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be dark and the moon will not give its light. So we're in the same passage, same thought, the sign of the Son of Man will appear. But look at verse 28. 
for, what, for wherever the carcass is, there the angels will be gathered together. Now, now it could be just that you're, you're, they're going to see the second coming because if you see, you know what, um, eagles gathering over a carcass at a distance, you know, hey, some, there's a dead body there, there's a dead thing there because I can see the, the, the eagles kind of circling up above. And it may be saying, hey, just as you see the lightning from the east, you're going to see eagles gathering. As you see eagles gathering, so you'll see the Son of Man. But more than likely, it's a picture of judgment. In fact, you go to Revelation chapter 21, chapter 19, sorry, verse 21. Let me go there for you to save you a bit of time, but write it down. Here's what we read in Revelation 19, verse 21. As it regards the battle of Armageddon, the unfolding of God's judgment at the end, and, and, and we read in verse 21, and the rest were killed with the sword which proceeded from the mouth of Jesus Christ, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. I mean, that, that's a picture, again, of devastation. In fact, go to verse 17 of Revelation 19. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to the birds that fly in the midst of the heavens, come and gather together for the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings and captains and mighty men, horses and those that sat on them, and all the flesh of people, free and slave, great and small. What a horrific picture. That while Jesus gathers the elect, the, visit, the, the judgment of God is visited on the unbelieving world that has stood up against him. And the eagles will gather above to take of this great supper as people who have been swallowed up in God's wrath. So that's the second coming. And as we move on, <clears throat> let's not miss the point, the striking contrast between the first coming and the second coming. And I want to say to you, if you're not saved this morning and in the service or listening, thank God you're living between the interval and you've got time to get saved. You've got time to get to the cross before it's too late. Because you see, the, the, the cross is scorched ground. The wrath of God fell upon Jesus Christ in AD 33, just outside the city of Jerusalem, in a place called the Skull, known as Golgotha. And there he became sin, he who knew no sin, that we might become righteous in him. He, the just, became unjust, and the wrath of God was poured out on him. And in a sense, that scorched ground. The wrath of God fell on Jesus on Calvary. Now, if you know anything about scorched ground, fire can't take hold on scorched ground. That's why our brave firefighters, when in the midst of a hot summer in California, they start backfires. They start fires in the back of and in the front of the fire so that when the fire comes to an area that they have burned deliberately, it can't go any further because there's no vegetation, no trees, no dry bushes for it to grab hold of. That's all being burned. And that's the picture of Calvary. You want to be safe on Judgment Day? You better be standing on Calvary, the scorched ground where God's wrath fell on God's Son. You need to get saved, my friend. You need to put your trust in Jesus Christ. And He came the first time to save you. You know, Jesus Christ said, I'm come not to condemn the world, but that the world through me might be saved. He didn't come to rub it in. He came to rub it out. That's what old Vance Havner used to say. And it's my job and this church's job and your father's job and your mother's job to tell you that message. Don't, don't be harsh to them. Don't, don't criticize us for loving you enough to tell you to flee from the wrath of God, the wrath to come. Because when he comes a second time, he won't be so nice. He came the first time and he allowed himself to be judged by man. He'll come the second time and he'll judge man. Pilate will be judged by Christ in the second coming. He came the first time and they crowned him with thorns. He's coming the second time. He'll be crowned with honor and with glory. He came the first time and he said, come. Come to me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. I'll give you rest. Come to the waters of life. If you don't come, he'll come the second time and say, depart from me. I never knew you. I gave you a chance. I waited. I was long-suffering. I appealed through the conviction of my spirit and showed you me through my people. And you said, No. When he came the first time, he submitted to the rule of human government. The second time, all the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our God and Savior. My friend, we're living in the interval between the first coming and the second coming. 
he veiled his glory. But the second time it will be unveiled and it will be a fearful sight. Be ready. For in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man comes. That's what brought me to Jesus Christ, that verse. I hope it moves you towards the cross and the eternal salvation. That's the setting. That's the signs. That's the second coming. Well, we've got to keep moving. The summons. The summons. This is verses 20. Um, let me see. 28 through the end of the chapter. Because Jesus here moves from details to duties. He's outlined all the details that will describe the events of the last days, but now he moves to duties. He moves to the things that the last days generation should do. Remember, we made an argument that verse 30, this generation will not pass away, is not Israel. It, it, it's, it's, it's a description of the generation that will be alive to see all of this. That will certainly include many in unbelieving Israel, but it will include the Gentile, where Jesus is simply saying, there's going to be a generation who will see the beginning of the signs, they'll see the big sign, they'll be alive after these days to see me coming in power and glory. And you know what? If you're believing... During that time, if you're part of the elect, if you're one of my followers, then I've got several things to tell you about how you ought to live. Remember what we said? This passage has no direct relevance to the church. The church isn't being addressed. The rapture is not in view. This is directed to the generation that will live to see it. It's not directed to the, the crowd at A.D. 70. It's, it's speaking to His disciples then, but often in prophetic Scripture, the immediate generation is being addressed, but actually a later generation is in mind. So Jesus summons those who will be alive during the last days to certain action. When I was at the Master's Seminary, Dr. George Zimmick used to say that biblical eschatology is an ethical eschatology. Jesus always preached ethical eschatology. You say, hold on a minute, Pastor. What do you mean eschatology? Big word. Big word. It simply means the doctrine of the second coming, the doctrine of the last days. And George Zimmick said that Jesus always taught it ethically. There was always a moral application. There was always a moral imperative that came with it. In fact, one commentator says of these last verses in Mark 13, that what we have here is a depiction of the future flanked by moral exhortation. I like that. Of course it's flanked by moral exhortation, because that's how you and I are to live out our doctrine of the second coming. We're not given all the details of the future to satisfy our curiosity or to tickle our fancy. It's to light a fire under us to live a certain way before we don't have an opportunity again to live a certain way, to be found ready at Jesus' return. In fact, if you study the sermon here given on Mount Olives, on the Mount of Olives, known as the Olivet Discourse, there are 19 imperatives in this sermon. There are 19 calls to action. A love for the second coming, a desire to live in the light of it, always leads to action, not inaction, obedience not passivity. I've always liked Warren Wiersbe. I've read almost all that he's written and have all of his books in my library. I remember reading somewhere that he said once, as it relates to the second coming, that early in his life he was part of what he called the organizing committee. You know, he spent a lot of time trying to work out prophetic truth and put all the details on a calendar and, and know all about the its and bits of doctrine regarding the future. And he was part of the organizing committee. He was kind of trying to all work it out. And then after a while, later on in life, he said, you know what? I realize that's not the emphasis of the New Testament. It's about obedience. It's about living for Jesus Christ in the light of His soon return. So here's what he said, and I'm passing it on to you. Write it down and think about it. He said, there came a day when I left, I resigned from the organizing committee and joined the welcoming committee. Now, he's speaking metaphorically, right? He's just saying, there came a day where I realized, hey, I need to know prophetic truth, and he tried to understand it. Do you know what? Most of all, i got to live in the light of it and be ready to welcome him 
be found ready. And some of us need to get off the organizing committee and get onto the welcoming committee. And Jesus is going to help us do this. Now, I'm going to look at three things quickly regarding this summons. But you might say to me, and rightly so, Pastor, I thought you said last week that the church is not addressed in Mark 13. Well, certainly not directly. You're right. This is addressed to the generation that will be alive when Jesus comes back. Its focus is on the Jewish people because you've got words like synagogue, you've got the temple mentioned, you've got the Sabbath, you've got Judea mentioned. It's in the future. It's the end time generation. So while it has no direct application to us, it has an indirect application. Jesus will say more than three things. I'm going to highlight three things here about the last day's generation and what they need to be doing. And if, what's, if that's true about the second coming, would it not also be true about the way you and I ought to live prior to the rapture? And I'll prove that as we go along. So here's three things quickly regarding the summons. Number one, Jesus summons them to preparation or preparedness. To this generation who will be alive to see it all, Jesus said, look, you don't know the hour and you don't know the day that I'm coming back, verse 32. Only my Father knows that, so you better be ready. You better be prepared. You better be alert. You better be watchful. That's how he ends, doesn't he? In verse 36, you need to be, don't be found sleeping. I say to you all, watch. The second coming requires alertness to be cognizant of the unfolding events. Because while this isn't true of the church age, this last day generation will see these things happen, and they can work out, generally speaking, that His coming's close. I forget Jesus argues that, and He uses the fig, figure of a fig tree. I don't think that's a, a metaphor for Israel in this case. I don't think we need to read that into this text. He's just simply saying, hey, imagine it's spring you start to see the fig tree blossoming. Now, when you see the fig tree blossoming, you know it's spring. And when it's spring, you know that summer's not far away. And he says, when you see these things happening, the wars, rumors of wars, spiritual deception, persecution, the the, the Antichrist standing up in the temple declaring himself to be God, you better believe it, my coming's not far away. At the doors, he says here, doesn't he? So you better be prepared. The signs will tell you that. And then he goes on, he changes his metaphors. So you're moving from verse 28 to 31, to verses 32 to 37. And we go from the outdoors looking at fig trees to the indoors. And there's a master who's gathered all his household servants and, and, and he says to them, hey, I'm leaving. Going on a trip. Won't be back for a while. Hey, got, got to say something to you, you know, keep the kitchen clean, keep sure the bed's all tidy, make sure the gardens are in good repair, so on and so forth. We read here, don't we, in verse 34, he says to them about each his work, and he commands the doorkeeper to watch. And then he heads off. And the whole point of the story is, boy, they better be ready. No sleeping on the job. You don't know when the master's coming back. Now, there were three... Uh, watches in a Jewish day, but there were four in a Roman day. Six o'clock at night till nine, nine o'clock to twelve, twelve to three, three to six. And Jesus takes that idea and says, hey, you know when the master's coming back. He, 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 he could come back in the evening, six to nine. He could come back at midnight, nine to twelve. He could go back at the crowing of the rooster, uh, twelve to three, and he could go back uh, in the morning from three to six. Something like that. And he says, hey, you better be ready. Don't be found sleeping. Maybe it's 9 to 12, 12 to 3, 3 to 6, 6 to 9. I can't remember. But, but you, get the, you get the idea. You get these. You know when the master's coming, he could come at any one of those four parts of the night. And uh, you need to be prepared. So this is a section frackled with the call to readiness. And Jesus is saying to the end time generation, be ready, be watchful, be prepared. Now, is that not the same when it comes to the church waiting for the Savior at the rapture? I I think it is. In fact, I'm sure it is. Let me give you an example. Go over to 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 10. 
We have a description of those who came to Christ in Thessalonica and the, uh, the transformation that took place, which was wonderful. They turned to God from idols to serve the true and the living God. If any man's in Christ, he's a new creature. Change comes. Faith without works is dead. Don't tell me you walked forward at a meeting and got saved if I can't see any evidence that you're still walking after Christ. But here they started following him, turned from idols. They, they serve him. And notice this verse 10. And they wait for his son from heaven. If you and I are true Christians, we're living in the light of the second coming. In fact, when you go to chapter 5 of this letter and verse 5, uh, we're, we're, we're told that we're not children of the night. We're not going to be part of the darkness that will envelop the world. We're children of the day. Therefore, verse 6 of chapter 5, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. Those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But let those of us who are of the day be sober. So, so just like the generation alive during the tribulation to witness Jesus' return, in the church age, you and I are still to be prepared, alive, awake, alert to Jesus any moment return for His church that requires no fulfillment of prophecy and no sign to announce it. In fact, that little word, wait, doesn't do that justice. It would be better translated, wait up. Wait up. Now that's, that's something quite different. Wait's kind of passive, like standing at a bus stop. Waiting up. Well, well that's different. Maybe you're waiting up, uh, you know, for somebody to arrive or waiting up for an, an event to take place or a ball game that's going to be, be played late at night and you're a fan. There's this waiting up with excitement and activity. In fact, let me give you my illustration of it. Uh, you've heard me share this before. When I was back home a week or so ago seeing my mom her 80th birthday, I realized two things. One, you never stop being a mother's son and your mother never stops being a mother. You know, I'm 55, she's 80, but she treated me like I was 15. You know, sit down, what do you need? And went into the kitchen and started making me supper and, you know, how you doing? And, you know, all of that. You get it. So it's a beautiful thing. We love our mothers. We don't deserve their love. Their love is undying in the best of cases. And when I was in the RUC, when I was a police officer in Northern Ireland during the height of the troubles, it was very dangerous. I don't say that to draw attention to myself. I worked out of a police station in North Belfast. We were more likely to be killed off duty than on duty. I checked my car every morning for booby traps. I carried a weapon on me wherever I went to my day job as a lay Baptist preacher. That was always fun when the congregation was sleeping. You'd kind of do this, you know. <laughs> Let's turn to Mark chapter 13. Yeah, get, them, get, the, get their attention, you know. So, but, but that aside... When I did it, when I did a, a, my day job as an engineer, I, I often did night shifts with the police. So I'd work often from about 7 to 12 and sometimes 1 in the morning, sometimes later. But on those evenings, invariably, I can tell you, my mother waited up. I can say this. I'm kind of sad to say it. I saw her go gray during those six years, worrying whether I'd come home with my two arms and my two legs or come home at all. And she'd wait up. I often caught her. She sometimes, you know, would just make sure I was in and slip to bed and not let on. She'd wait it up. But as I was coming down from parking my car at the top of the street, I was living with my parents at the time, packed my little, or closed my little Ford Fiesta hatchback, walking down the street, I'd often see a flutter of the curtains or maybe the Venetian blinds being lifted and a little eye popping out. Philip's home. I can go to bed. My boy's home. You'd be in bed soon, safe and sound, waiting up. You know, dad fast asleep. I don't know what that meant upstairs, but, <laughs> you know, mom, mom's downstairs. Dad's fast asleep, you know. Um, it's a great picture, waiting up. She can't rest until Philip's home. It's not going to be right till her boy's in bed. And that's the picture. They got saved from paganism, idolatry, and they started serving the Lord, following Him, and they waited up for His Son from heaven. That's a New Testament church. They knew they were children of the day, not, they weren't going to let the night take over or overtake them. I, I like what um, a, a writer uh, says, a man by the name of Peter Lewis, great English expositor in his book, 
be Christ-like, speaking on Matthew 24, he says, keeping watch here is not like waiting at a bus stop, but working at your job, living with your family, witnessing in the world, faithfully looking to Christ as Lord and judge for your vindication and for that well-done, faithful servant. It's not passive. It's not standing at a bus stop just waiting for Jesus to arrive. It's you being on the job, focused with an eye to the sky and wanting to be found like the doorkeeper, like the housekeeper, when the master comes back doing your job. That's preparedness. Number two, prayer. Prayer. Look at verse 33, back at Mark 13. We're on the summons. What do you ought to be doing in the last days prior to Jesus coming? Well, you ought to be prepared, watchful, alert, and you ought to be praying. Look at verse 33, take heed, watch and pray, for you do not know what the time is. Now, some of you right now are going, I don't see the word prayer in my Bible, because it's not there in some of your modern versions. This is a debate, Uh, it's found in some manuscripts, it's not found in other manuscripts, and so there's a debate among the scholars, does it belong in there? And we're not going to get into that. And in fact, let's just settle the argument, even if it's not there, You and I know that when the Bible tells us to watch, watchfulness and prayer are Siamese twins. In fact, Mark 14, 38, you'll find this in your Bible, even a modern version, where Jesus says to the sleeping disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane, what? Watch and pray. And so I think it's included. It's in my Bible, but it's not in yours. It's it's embedded there watchfulness, taking heed, prayerfulness. Our watchfulness leads to prayerfulness. When Jesus comes, the world will be made to kneel and acknowledge that He is Lord, but the believing remnant at that moment ought to be found on their knees in prayerful reliance. Now, what will they be praying? What would you pray in the last days? Remember, I don't think we're being addressed here. So, what will the tribulation saints be praying? We're not told. But I would have a guess. Would you agree with me that the Lord's Prayer could be a good prayer for them? Because I was thinking about this. If you're a tribulation saint and you haven't submitted to the Antichrist, you haven't taken the mark of the beast, we're told in the book of Revelation, if you don't have that mark, whatever that mark is, you can't buy and you can't sell. That's pretty tough when they refuse you at the supermarket. It would seem to me you'd be praying, Lord, give us this day our daily bread. And if you live in a world at that time that's dominated by the Antichrist, the false prophet, and the false prophets and messiahs that Jesus talks about, and the strong delusion that God's going to send, it's a day of dynamic, dyn- uh, demonic domination. I'll tell you another thing you'll pray. Jesus taught us, deliver us from the evil or the evil one. And if you live in a world where you've lived long enough to see the abomination of desolation, an antichrist rising up in the temple, according to 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 4, a rebuilt temple, and declaring himself to be God and calling the world to worship him. I'll tell you another thing you'll pray, your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Come in power and glory for yours is the power and the glory. You'll want to see an end to man's mismanagement. You'll want to see Jesus Christ crush the Antichrist if you're a tribulation saint. You'll be praying, give us this day our daily bread. You'll be praying, deliver us from evil. You'll be praying, your kingdom come. If you're a tribulation saint, you'll be praying like crazy. Prepared, prayerful. Now, I want to ask you a question. Is that not the same in the church age? Are we not to be praying Do we not want to be found on our knees in prayerful reliance and dependence upon God if Jesus should call us home and catch us up in the air? I think so. In 1 Peter 4, verse 7, 1 Peter 4, verse 7, you'll read about this call to prayer in the light of Jesus' return. Let me go there for you. But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. Be watchful in your prayers. There's another reason to see. If it's not there explicitly, it's there implicitly. Watch and pray. And above all, have a sincere love for one another and cover one another's sins by love. Be hospitable and don't grumble. What's the second to last verse in the Bible? Okay, I'll help you. Revelation 22, 20. What is it? It's a prayer. Who prayed it? John. What did he pray? Even so come. 
Lord Jesus. I like to pray that. I'm tired. I'm tired of fighting with my sin nature. I'm tired of seeing the glory of Jesus Christ be dragged through the mud in the media and an unbelieving world. I'm tired of God's people being persecuted and marginalized. I'm just tired of that. I'm tired of, 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 of truth on the scaffold and evil on the throne. I'm ready for Jesus to come and, and do some sorting out. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. And let me say this in closing. I know time's gone. We've got the Lord's table. But, but I have often thought about prayer as an act of reverence. And I've often thought about prayer as an act of reliance. But I was reading a book, Peter Lewis again, Be Christ-like, excellent book. I never thought about prayer as an act of rebellion, but that's what it is. He makes an argument that petitionary prayer is an act of rebellion against the world order. It's us not submitting. It's us not accepting the abnormal as normal. It's us not accepting man's mismanagement. It's us praying against the world order. It's us praying that God's kingdom would come. It's us praying against the status quo and the evil that indeed is being normalized in our day. Listen to Peter Lewis when he addresses this. Petitionary prayer involves thoughtful, deliberate prayer requests, often about the wider scheme in a fallen world, about matters far from home, beyond our own power to change. It is a persistent cry of the church against unbelief, against sorrow, suffering, hatred, spiritual darkness in a fallen world. It is a cry, your kingdom come. And then he quotes David Wells, whose writings have helped many of us in a book on world missions where David Wells says, it is the essence of rebellion. Rebellion against the world and its fallenness, the absolute and undying refusal to accept as normal what is pervasively abnormal. You want to thumb your nose at the world? Get on your knees and pray. Do some subversive action in prayer, praying that indeed God will vindicate himself and his people too often we use, as John Piper says, prayer as a domestic intercom. I don't have one in my home, but I have a friend who's got one of those intercoms in every room in his house. Kind of cool little thing, you know? You can hit a, hit a button, tell your kids, hey, get down here. You've got five seconds or you're dead, <laughs> you know? So, hey, it's a good thing, domestic intercom, domestic intercom. But he says, that's not what prayer really ought to be. Now, we use it that way. Hey, Lord, I need this, I need that. Could you give me another pillow in the living room? I, I, I'm, I need to be made comfortable, Lord. He says, no, prayer's a walkie-talkie, a wartime walkie-talkie, where we call for God's power to be unleashed in the world for a fight back against sin and evil. And that's what, that's what David Wells is saying. That's what Peter Lewis is saying. I, I love that. Think about that. Prayer's not just an act of reverence. It's not just an act of reliance. It's an act of rebellion. And the church is praying in an act of rebellion against a world order set up against God and His glory, and Jesus Christ is going to topple it. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Last thought, way out of time. Preparedness, prayer, finally proclamation. Proclamation. Now this, Mark 13, let's go to verse 10 of Mark 13. This is last day's living. This is the tribulation saints and the actions they ought to be taken. Remember, there's 19 imperatives in Mark 13. Here's another one. And the gospel must first be preached. There's an imperative, preached in all the nations. Proclamation. Prophetically speaking, this will be fulfilled in the last days. We're not going to go to these verses, but follow me. I believe Revelation is futuristic. I believe once you get past chapter 4, or you get to chapter 4, past chapter 3, everything's future. It's not being fulfilled in the New Testament or the church age. And this is a time that lies in the future, a time that Jesus describes here, a time of great tribulation. And what happens? Well, if you go to Revelation 7, 1 to 17, you'll find out that God seals, saves, and then sends 144,000 people were called witnesses out into the world. And you know what? 
a great number of people get saved. Many of them are martyred, and they end up in heaven, and the elders say, who are these that have come out of great tribulation? Out of every tongue and every tribe and every nation, which tells me those 144,000 did a great job of getting across the world to every tribe and tongue and nation. Now, if that's not enough, you go to Revelation chapter 11, verses 1 to 13, and there are two witnesses beyond the 144,000. They met, that might be Moses and Elijah. We're not sure. It's not that important, but these two witnesses witness to the world. And then the Antichrist and the false prophet, that is the first beast and the second beast, destroy them, kill them. And the world watches. It says the whole world watches. And God raises them from the dead. Can you imagine that? on um, the Clinton News Network on a, on, on, on a, on a 6 o'clock evening broadcast, all jokes aside, the world will watch it. It'll be on Fox, it'll be on CNN, it'll be on MSNBC, the two witnesses rising from the dead. The world will stagger. What a witness worldwide. And if that's not enough, Revelation 14, 6 to 8, where one angel, as the judgments of God falls, will indeed evangelize the world himself. So in the last days, tribulation, the world will be evangelized, the nations will be reached, and boom, Jesus will come. Question as we close, is that not the same in the church age? Aren't we to be prepared? Yes. Aren't we to be praying? Yes. Aren't we to be preaching? Yes. Unless somebody can tell me otherwise, I think we got our marching orders clearly in Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20. They haven't been rescinded. If you're not in the game of discipling evangelism, you're AWOL, you're disobedient, and, 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 and you're betraying your commitment to Jesus Christ because we're to go into all the world, preach the gospel, right? Win people, make them disciples, baptize them, get them connected to a local church, and on and on it goes. That's what we are to be doing. We're to be as witnesses. According to one Chapter 1, verse 8 of Acts. So what's true of the last generation is true of the, every generation within the church age. That's our challenge. Be preaching, be proclaiming. Are you sharing the gospel? When's the last time you actually shared the gospel cogently, clearly, and convincingly to someone? You got to be doing that. Because you see, we're in the interval. He came the first time to see if he comes the second time to judge. We've only got so much time to win them. Paul says, I, I do all that I can, become all that I can to win some. Are you winning some? And are you win some when it comes to the gospel? In fact, let, let's finish with Acts 1, verse 8. Be witnesses. Okay, that's what we're to be. And then what do we read in verse 9, 10 and 11? Jesus then was taken up into heaven. He ascended. And we read that the disciples were like, standing there, you know, bug-eyed. And that the angel says, hey, guys, what are you doing? Why stand you gazing up into the heavens? This same Jesus that was received into the heavens will come again in a similar manner, which means physically, visibly, and then in power and glory, cataclysmically, judgmentally, all of that that we outlined a few minutes ago. Hey, guys, the prophetic conference is over. Get out onto the streets and I start evangelizing. Why stand you gazing into the heavens? Jerry Vines was a Southern Baptist preacher I have enjoyed. And he's got a famous sermon. He's preached at several conventions across America. He's now retired. It's called... Stargazers are soul winners. And he bases it on this very passage. Why stand you gazing into the heavens? Do you not remember he told you to be witnesses in Jerusalem, Samaria? Now, guys, get on with it. He'll be with you to the end of the age. Listen to what Jerry Vine says. A lot of people are so interested in being stargazers, they are not soul winners. Read about the signs of the times, yes, but don't forget the size of the times and the people who are hurting, lonely, and in need of Jesus. Study the ten toes of Daniel, but don't fail to take your feet and get out onto the highways and byways and tell others of Jesus. Ride the wings of the angels in the book of Revelation, but ride your car across the city to a place where you can share the gospel to the least 
on the lost. We need to get excited about it. Jesus is coming. People need to come to him. So let's get working at winning souls. And amen to that. No more stargazing. No more elaborate charts. We're not going to be alive to see that generation or all that's happening. We're the church. The rapture's coming. There are no signs, no prophecy. Let's get on with loving Jesus, raising our children in the fear and admonition of the Lord, doing a good day's work, keeping ourselves pure, keeping ourselves from idols, loving one another, reaching the lost until that moment happens. I just finished the book. I'd recommend it to you. How God used R.A. Torrey. R.A. Torrey, founded by Ola University, by the way. And it's a book written by Fred Sanders, who is over the Torrey ministry at Biola. And in it, interesting, in a book on how God used R.A. Torrey, there's a sermon called How God Used D.L. Moody. And then at Tory, who traveled with D.L. Moody, says he was, one, a fully surrendered man, two, a man of prayer, three, a deep practical student of the Bible, four, a humble man, five, he was free from the love of money, six, he was endued with the power of the Holy Spirit, and seven, he had a consuming passion for the lost. That's not a bad checklist, by the way. You want to be used by God? Follow all of those things. But he loved the lost. He was an evangelist. Do you know what he committed to? He said, I can't go to bed and I shouldn't go to bed any night of the day until I've shared the gospel with someone at some part of the day. In fact, I had a friend had that same commitment, Jim Henry, who helped disciple me back in Northern Ireland. He's with the Lord. He said, Philip, I've made it my goal each and every day to have a one meaningful conversation with a lost soul. What about you and me? Are we fulfilling that? Just, just one soul. If we all were reaching one soul a day for Jesus Christ, there would be a lot happening in our world. In fact, in the book, R.A. Torrey tells the story that one night, Moody got so tired, slept in the bed. He was in his jammies, all tucked up, comfortable. You know how, when, when that's like, the last thing you want to do is get back out of bed. And yet he remembered, I haven't shared the gospel with somebody. And he actually got up, put his clothes on, as tired as he was. He went to the doorstep of his home and he looked out and it was raining cats and dogs. And he said, well, hey, Lord, I've made a good effort. There's nobody going to be out on the street. I'm going back to bed. And then he thought, oh, I can't. And he opened his door and he listened. And he didn't hear anybody for a while. And then he heard the pitter-patter feet of a man coming along the sidewalk under an umbrella. And according to R.A. Torrey, as the man comes by Moody's house, the guy ducks out of his doorway under the umbrella and starts talking to the guy as they walk down the street. And as he's talking, he says at some point in the conversation, he says, my friend, do you have a shelter for the time of storm? It's an old phrase in a hymn that's basically talking about the second coming and the need to get saved. Do you have a a shelter in the time of storm? Here you are under an umbrella and the rain's coming, but someday God's judgment will rain down. Are you saved, my friend? And he actually leads them to Christ under the umbrella and he gets back to the business of sleeping. Actually, in another part of the book, Moody challenges a man one day on the street and says, sir, are you a Christian? And the man says, hey, you, mind your own business. To which Moody replies, sir, it is my business. To which the man replies, then you must be D.L. Moody. (laughs) Wow. I like that kind of reputation. God give us a heart for the lost. You know, we're safe and sound and secure. We're not appointed under wrath, but to salvation. We're not in the world without God and without hope. We've got the blessed hope of the glorious appearing of our God and Savior. But they don't. They have no shelter in the time of storm. Let's get them to Calvary, to the scorched earth of that place where God judged our sin. And if he finds us there at his second coming, we're safe. What ought you and I to be doing? Just like the tribulation saints, we ought to be prepared. We ought to be prayerful. And we ought to be proclaiming the gospel. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this word. Help us indeed to be ready. For in such an hour as we think not, the Son of Man comes. Find us alert. 
Find us on our knees. Find us on our feet sharing the gospel for Jesus' sake. Amen.